as well. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, saints, our Sunday school lesson is coming to us from page 31 in our Sunday school book. That's page 31 in our Sunday school book. And the lesson this morning is loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor. And the scripture comes from St. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And this passage of scripture is a very familiar passage of scripture. It deals with the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, as we've often heard. And the Lord uses that story to teach us saints that we are to be like the good Samaritan. And as I said before, we live in a day and a time and an age where, as this lesson points out for us today, loving your neighbor is very important. And we also have to be mindful of, well, who exactly is our neighbor? Our neighbor is not necessarily the person that lives in the same community that we live in, that stay next door to us. But actually, our neighbor is anyone that has need of our help. And that's the reason the Lord say, love your neighbor. Love those that have need of you. And so as we look at our scripture this morning, St. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, I'm going to read this scripture for you, and then we'll go back and look at and analyze what is it that the Lord is trying to say to us this morning. So saints, St. Luke chapter 25, verse 37, I mean 25 through 37, verse 25, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you interpret it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? See, the lawyer here, he really wasn't confused about who his neighbor was, but rather he was trying to catch Jesus in an uncanny way. And so he's asking, well, who is my neighbor? And saints, that's the thing that we have to ask ourselves, who is our neighbor? But we have to understand who our neighbor is. And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two dineros and gave to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. 
And whatsoever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So saints, as I said before, this is a familiar passage of scripture. And we've looked at it on many different occasions on exactly who was our neighbor. And one of the things that God is pointing out to us in the scripture is that our neighbor is not necessarily the person that we thought it would be. In other words, the person that came to our rescue when we were in trouble may have not been the person that we thought would have come. It may have been a perfect stranger that came to our rescue. And that's the point that the Lord is making here in this scripture. So as we look at this passage of scripture, understanding of who is my neighbor. Saints, we live in a time and age where people are not as readily willing to be our neighbors as in times past. So I, I think back to times when I was a child and especially in the African American communities, uh, we used to really pride ourselves on helping and taking care of our neighbors. Uh, if someone in the neighborhood was in need of something, the neighborhood came together to help that individual or that family or, or whatnot. And that was in essence, the nature and the character of God. But saints, as God calls us to overcome the systemic system that held us back at the time, and I say the systemic system that held us back at the time because we um, actually only had ourselves to rely on. And so as African Americans, we had to rely on one another. And there was a system in place that kept us at a level that was beneath others that prevented us from being as prosperous. And of course, some people were more prosperous than others, but the willingness of each individual to help one another is what was pleasing to God. And now, saints, we live in a day and age where many of us are very prosperous in life. God has really blessed us, but we've walked away from the care of helping our neighbors and loving our neighbors in a sense that the word says that we should. Saints, we've actually become what's described as being or having selfish desires. We're only thinking about ourselves and me and mine and taking care of myself. We're seeking self-gratification, and we only pursue self-interest. All of these are values that consume time that take us away from being neighborly. So, saints, I want you to think about where do you fit in this scenario? Are you selfish? Are you seeking self-gratification? Are you seeking your own self-interest? Or do you take the opportunity to help others along the way? That is the nature that God desires for us to have as representatives of him. So saints, as we continue on with this lesson, let's look at on um, page 33, um, where it breaks down some analysis of the 25th and the 28th verse. And the command to love one's neighbor was seen as a key moral commandment of the law in Leviticus. It is cited often in the New Testament as the summation of the whole law of Moses. And we know what that summation is. The Lord say, it says, love the Lord thy God with all your being and then love thy neighbor. 
And in doing so, you have fulfilled the entire law of the Lord. But this lawyer, of course, being an expert in Jewish religion and Moses' law, he wasn't being genuine when he was asking the Lord who was his neighbor. He was actually seeking an opportunity, an opportunity to trap the Lord. And in verse 29 and 32, the lawyer asked Jesus to define who was to be considered a neighbor, likely looking for the legal definition. And sometimes saints, that's the thing that trips us up is that we're looking for the legal definition of who our neighbor is. But remember, I said early on, our neighbor is anybody that needs our help, especially with us being representatives of Jesus Christ. And so keep that in mind as we continue to go through the scripture. In verse 33, the priests and the Levites may have thought, of course, that the injured man or injured person was dead. And so they passed by on the other side, avoiding being made ritually unclean. Because, of course, the Leviticus law said that the priests, you know, they're not supposed to touch dead things. And so they were doing the religious ritual thing. But the law also stated that a person encountering a dead person's body was to stop and bury it. And this took precedence and should have compelled them to attend to the person regardless. Now, saints, what I want you to think about is that as this scripture is laying out the priest and the Levite, I want you to understand that the priest represents the man of the cloth, the man of God, the preachers, the pastors, all of those individuals. But the Levite represents us, the believers, the servants of God that operate inside of the modernized church. We are the Levites. And so where the preacher or the priest or the pastor fail to carry out their role, we had an obligation also as believers, as the Levites, as the servants of God, to carry out an equal role as well. But what we see here is because of religious beliefs and religious sayings, they, they avoided their moral efficacy. In other words, they failed to do what was required of them. And like many of us saints, we'll do the same thing. We'll fail in doing what we're supposed to do and we'll make excuses as to why we didn't do the neighborly thing as God has called us to do. So I want us to think about something here. Um, so in our lesson today, of course, it's quite timely in the midst of the presence worldwide, there's a pandemic. When the neighborliness of so many categories of persons is called upon. So we have those doctors, we have those nurses, we have first responders, we have the average citizen, we have scientists. All of these or individuals that are called upon right now in this day and time to be neighborly because of this worldwide pandemic that we're struggling through. And saints, even our government officials at the highest level are supposed to be part of this very neighborly thing as well. Because understanding something that COVID-19 is not a respecter of persons, just like God is not a respecter of persons. And so I, I, I do know and understand that COVID-19 didn't take God by surprise, but rather God uses a thing to help us be who he said 
that we should be and to be who we say that we are being. And so God uses this thing or is using this thing, COVID-19, to cause us to be neighborly towards one another. How are you responding? As Christians, we see the Good Samaritan as an example of a selfless servant to strangers and have used that name for countless uh, situations or countless um, institutions such as hospitals and organizations, the Good Samaritan, and, and so on. Because understanding what the Good Samaritan represents. So in natural disasters and disease, you know, the Good Samaritans, the organizations, they are some of the first responders to some of these devastating situations. And so, saints, we are to be those Good Samaritans, especially if we're going to love our neighbor in the way that God says that we should love our neighbors. And so we are to show ourselves selfless and help these individuals. So saints, what I want to do now is just take this opportunity to go back through some of the scripture and begin to just break down the message that God is trying to get to us in this scripture. And so when we go back and we look at, of course, this Jewish man was en route from Jerusalem to Jericho on this road. And of course, this road uh, was well known for being a crime-ridden area. In other words, if you go down there a certain time of the day or at night and you're by yourself, you could be subject to being killed or robbed or, or some other crime committed against you. And that's what we're looking at here on the Jericho Road. And so as we go back and look at some of the scripture, let's look at where it says, it says, now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. The priest and the Levite both saw, of course, their Jewish brother lying in a terrible condition, but neither of them did anything. They both passed by on the other side of the road. Now, priests and Levites, of course, are mentioned here partly because they were the most frequent travelers on this road. And so it was common for them to be traveling on the Jericho Road. And also, this is partly to show that these were the persons who, from the nature of their office, which seem to be the most obligated to help an individual in need, the priest and the Levite. Remember, the priest is the preacher, the pastors. The Levites are you and I that are servants in the church that claim the name of the Lord and say that we are saved and set free and we have our salvation in the Lord. And so that obligates us to be neighborly, to show the character and the nature of God. And so in this passage of scripture, God is using this to show us that those that are supposed to more likely because of the role that or capacity upon which they serve, they're supposed to be more compassionate when it comes to helping someone. But we see here, saints, that that's not the case. And so, saints, I, I want you and I to think about this as we walk through our daily lives what excuses are we using to keep from doing that which God says that we should be doing? So I want you to think about that because all of these excuses, how many of them do we use? Let's look at some of the excuses that we use. And these are the same that the Levite and the priest probably used as well. It says, this road is too dangerous for me to stop and help this man. That's an excuse. He might be a decoy for an ambush. That's another excuse. And I say all of that, saints, because we are supposed to operate with the 
living Holy Spirit in us that gives us the spirit of discernment. And so we know um, when danger may exist ahead. But what God does in this case, he's using us or would like to use us to help someone that's in need. But we often make excuses to keep from doing so. Here's another excuse. I've got to go to the church and perform my services for the Lord. So I'm on my way to church. So I see somebody on the side of the road and they're in need. I can't stop and help them because I'm on my way to church. Saints, do you not know that you just committed the biggest atrocity of your faith because you placed religion that going to the church to provide a service ahead of your spiritual walk with God that said, stop and help this person that's in need. Another excuse. I've got to get home to see my family. My family waiting on me. I, I don't have time. Or I like this one. Someone really should stop and help this man. So we're riding by and we see this person in need and we say that somebody should stop and help them. Why not you? Another excuse. If I'm going to serve at the temple, I'm going to church. I can't get my clothes dirty. So I can't stop and help them because I'll get dirty. Or another excuse, I don't know first aid. Or it's a hopeless case. There's nothing I can do. Well, you could just stop and comfort the person. If you're not able to provide them the help that they need, you can stop and comfort them. Or you call someone that, that you may know of that can come and help. Or I'm only one person. This job is too big for me. Or I love this one, saints. I'll pray for him. God says faith without works is dead. And so we can have the faith to pray for them. But God say also there comes a time where we must show action because in our actions is the revealing of our character. And our character should reflect the nature of God. Think about that, saints. Another excuse we use, we say, well, he brought this upon himself, so man, he don't need my help because he shouldn't have did it. Well, that ain't what God said about you. He said, stop and help. Or he never asked for help. Sometimes people are not going to ask for help. God gave you a discerning spirit. When you see that individuals need help, you're supposed to step forward and help them. So, We've got to walk away from using excuses and we've got to become the good Samaritan. And in doing so, that makes us neighborly. That makes us love our neighbor as the Lord said that we should. Let's go on with the scripture, saints. It says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. I want you to think about that for a minute. Because the Samaritan was the most unlikely person that should have been or would have been helping this individual. So when Jesus' listeners in the scripture, as he was teaching this parable, when Jesus' listeners heard about the priest and the Levite, they probably expected Jesus to say something along the line that some common man, such as a, another Jewish brother, came about to help the man. But rather, that was not the case. It was a Samaritan man. Something that you need to know about this story that makes it really interesting, though, is that the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. The Jews hated the Samaritans. It was a religious hatred. It was also a racial hatred. And so they could not stand Samaritans. But yet, here's this Samaritan man 
on his journey, see this Jewish brother in need of help and stops to help him where his own would not. I want you to think about that because God is making a strong point with this particular message, saints, teaching us that those that come to our rescue sometimes are the most unlikely characters. And so even as being a having a character of God, we have to represent God. So we have to put our malices, our biases aside to do that which is considered to be the work of the Lord. Think about that. So the Samaritan man helped this brother. As we continue in the scripture, it says he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn and took care of him. So this Samaritan man was selfish, not selfish, selfless in his actions. He gave of his own to take care of this man. Not only did he give the man a means of travel and put the man on his own animal, which means that he probably had to walk beside the animal. But he bandaged up the man and he poured wine into the man's wound. And the wine was an antiseptic that actually helped to um, uh, uh, heal and get rid of bacteria. And the oil was the soothing to help get rid of the pain. He did this for this man and bandaged him up and then took him to the end. I want you to think about the efforts of this Samaritan man. And I want you to see this picture with me. This Samaritan man represented Jesus Christ. He represented Jesus Christ operating in our lives. How so? I'll tell you. There are many ways that the Samaritan was like Jesus. The Samaritan was an outsider despised by many. So people didn't like him. He was an outsider. He was despised. Remember, I just told you that the Jews could not stand the Samaritans. The Samaritan came after others failed to meet the need. So just like Jesus came after all other efforts had failed to accomplish the mission. The Samaritan came before it was too late. Jesus came in the nick of time to save you and I from the sin sick world and from self destruction. So many of us, like this Jewish man that had been robbed and beaten, Satan had done the same thing to us. We had lost our way and we couldn't pull ourselves up out of our own filthy mess. But lo and behold, here comes the Samaritan man. In our case, here comes Jesus the Christ to help us in the nick of time. The Samaritan man came with everything needed to bandage up the wounds and to help this brother. Jesus came with everything that we needed to bind up the brokenhearted and the wounds that were part of our lives. The Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. Jesus will come right to us. He said, all we have to do is call out his name, call on him, and he'll come to our rescue. The Samaritan man gave tender care. Jesus came and gave us care, mercy, provided us with grace, saved us from the destruction that was ahead of us. The Samaritan provided for future needs. When the Samaritan man carried him to the inn and provided money to the innkeeper to take care of the man, he was providing for the future needs. Jesus has provided 
for all of our needs, past, present, and future. All those things that Jesus has done for us is in essence a resemblance of what the Samaritan man did for this Jewish brother. And so, saints, we have to continue to be mindful of the message of the Good Samaritan. And like Jesus being the Good Samaritan in our lives, we also have to become the Good Samaritans for our neighbors. First 36 and 37, as Jesus is applying this parable, it says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus asked the lawyer, which one of these do you think was the neighbor? Remember, we had those that should have been the neighbors, the Levite, the priest, but of course, they failed to meet their obligation. And so Jesus is asking the lawyer here, so which of these three do you see as being the neighbor? And the neighbor, of course, as the lawyer had to say, the one that provided mercy to him. Your good Samaritan is the one that provided mercy to you. That means that it is Jesus Christ. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor? According to the thinking of the day, the priest and the Levite were supposed to have been neighbors. But as I said, they failed. So I'm going to ask you this question, saints, and you need to ask yourself this question. Who are you a neighbor to? So just like the Samaritan, who are you showing mercy to? Because many of us, we found out in our lives that sometimes our neighbor happens to be the person that we least likely expected to be. So who are you being a neighbor to? Are you loving your neighbor? And so at this point, Jesus tell the lawyer to go and do likewise. Jesus is telling us saints that we are to go and do likewise as the good Samaritan did. And as I told you, the Good Samaritan is a representation of Jesus Christ. So just as Jesus has done, we who are believers of Jesus Christ are supposed to do the same. So go and do likewise. This is God's message to us today, saints. And so, saints, my prayer for you, beloved, I wish above all that you will prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. And may God continue to bless you. Amen.